You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skabitsky. This week, we're joined by Lisa Kandera, a dedicated autism parent who, for 12 years, experienced constant anxiety and self-doubt following her son's ASD diagnosis. As a single mom raising a neurodivergent child, she understands the challenges intimately. Through coaching, Lisa discovered the importance of self-care, digging deep into triggers, and creating new empowering beliefs. Today, she shares her journey and how coaching transformed her approach to autism parenting. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure. And I mean, we talk about burnout in so many different ways. We talk about, and, and I can talk from the clinical side, is that clinicians experience burnout. Yeah. I think the one thing that we sometimes miss out on is we have high expectations for parents constantly without empathizing and sympathizing with burnout for them is probably even more of a risk and even a higher need to address now. Do you mind sharing with us your personal experience with burnout as an autism parent? Yeah, sure. I mean, it really takes on a couple of different forms, but I'll say initially when my son was diagnosed at the age of two, coming from a family of a neurodivergent sister um, who was diagnosed with PDD NOS, which is now on the autism spectrum, ADHD, I didn't feel like I was flat footed, right? I had seen a lot of examples through my parents of all the work that they had done to get her resources. And so my view was like, let's go. We've got these two years old. I know what I'm dealing with. Let's do all of the things. And so I hit the ground running until I hit the wall, but I would keep hitting the wall and then just getting back up, just getting back up. And, you know, that lasted for, you know, throughout his elementary school years. And it was when he was transitioning from sixth grade to seventh grade that I saw his anxiety was ramping up extremely and the expectations were getting higher. And I was at the point where I was thinking like, how am I going to keep doing this at this level? I worked a full-time job at that point. It was outside the home because this was pre COVID. And I was just really at my wits end. I was scared. I was had so much anxiety. And I was at that point of like, do I want to catch up somebody, a, a clinician, because I had just moved too. So, you know, I would get a new clinician. Did I want to catch up a clinician on like 45 years of life mm -hmm. to know how to do tomorrow better? And that's really what I wanted. And so that's how I found life coaching as a client. And it really helped me to see I mean, it, I mean, it sounds so corny, but the power that I had, because to, to that point, it always felt like life was happening at me. It was always a wait and see. Let's see if he's having a good day. Then I'll know how I can feel, how I'm going to show up. And life coaching really just flipped that on its head. And I and I loved it. And just being the type of person that I am, it's like, give me a little bit and I want more. And so it's like, okay, like possibly consuming it on podcast, then doing it as a client. And then I was like, well, I want to get certified. So I know the ins and the outs. And then of course, once I did, there was like, it was a no brainer that I would offer this to other parents like me, because I know from years of research, there's nothing out there specifically for us. Mm -hmm. All of the resources are really aimed at how we can help our children. And while life coaching will help you do that, you are the focus. And that's really what I wanted. Like I had done support groups, but you know, they, most of them meet so infrequently that they didn't really, I didn't find them helpful. And then I would do sometimes Facebook groups and they have their place. It's nice to be seen, but being seen still wasn't helping me do Tuesday better. And that's mm -hmm. what I wanted. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that kind of you went through the journey on, I would imagine, is that going from that state of I'm seeing things a little bit differently. I don't know. This is new to me. This is a new experience. And you said that your son was diagnosed at two, but a lot of parents don't have even the knowledge to know all of my efforts, everything that I'm doing 
it might just not work for my child right now and I need to do something different. And then the self-doubt creeps in, the anxiety, like you said, the de the depression at times. Of, I don't feel like I'm doing everything to the best of my ability. Does that does that overwhelm parents? I, I, I could imagine early on in the process where you don't have any answers is that you put everything on your own shoulders. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's like the number one reason that parents will come to me. I think it's one of the biggest reasons they relate to me. I see it a lot early on in the journey. I'm going to be honest with you. I feel like I'm dealing with it more now where I am in the journey than I ever have. Because before I was always like, let's plow through. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And I have done so many things and there's still a tremendous struggle. So you get to the point where you're like, oh, I could do all the things and he still will suffer. He still will struggle. And that's more painful. And what I often say to parents is be careful about the blaming yourself and the purpose it's serving. Because what I find is we would rather blame ourselves and feel that we are at fault because that means we can fix it. That actually gives us more power because there's nothing worse than thinking there's nothing we can do or whatever we do, it doesn't matter. And so I think that's why one of the reasons that we tend to focus so much on our part on it was one, yes, we're taking on that responsibility. We love our children, but it also feels better to think it could be my fault. And if I just do it right, I can fix it. Then this is it. Not like this is it, but this is reality. This is part of our life. And there's an acceptance piece that we're resisting. Yeah. And I mean, as, as you shared that, actually, it's, it's triggering something in me. It's I don't think I had that same lived experience that I don't have. Uh, I didn't have the same um, experience with a neurodivergent child. I, I had a, a pretty typical development pattern for, for my daughters. So for me, is that I feel like I was always able to have numerous identities. I could be a father, a husband. Uh, I could be a business owner. I could be a contributor to the community. And every single thing felt like I, I could value at different times in different ways. What does that experience feel like for a parent, and especially as a single parent, where you probably went through a good portion of your son's childhood where it was probably tough to have numerous identities other than parent of an autistic child or a neurodivergent child. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting in that because I'm an attorney and I've, I'm still an attorney as a full-time attorney during the course of, you know, from birth until now. And so I did have other identities. And interestingly, those other identities were kind of my outlet for something that was not autism in its own way, right? Like that, those were, gave me opportunities to um, almost have a breather from it in some ways, but then you're always operating as the person that has these issues that are going on. And so when it, like, for instance, when it came to like, you know, being tagged onto cases where there'd be a lot of travel, no, because I just can't get a babysitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> Like that's Absolutely. just not really in the cards. And so it definitely impacted my career choices. It impacted um, a lot of things, I think, about my career and my trajectory. And you know, none of that is like really in a bad way. But like once it becomes part of you, it's, it's just part of you and you account for it every day in every decision. So like when there was like family days, you know, at the partner's like, you know, house or there was like, you know, take us out to the ball game that looked different for us, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, it might for other families. Yeah. And I mean, even those simple life choices, like you were describing, it's, it, it carries every single decision is taking into account just the, the family concept that, you know, what is it going to feel like? What are others going to think? Are they going to be accepting? Are they going to empower me through this choice? Are they going to empower my child through this choice? Yep. Um, and I think that that's something that I don't know everybody takes into account through the, the journey of raising somebody who is neurodivergent or who needs additional support or who maybe just experiencing life differently than me is, you know, how do we make sure that there's a place for it where the caretaker still has everything that they're trying to get out of life available to them and that the resources are there to do that? 
Is that one thing that you're talking with families about is, you know, how do you maintain balance in your approach? What are the resources out there so that you're not constantly feeling like I can't go and do other things is that I can still have my life around me, but I'm experiencing it in a way where it's enjoyable and my child is enjoying it with me throughout the process, but there's also time for myself yeah. and I can then step aside. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's a very um, person specific exercise. Um, there's a lot of balance that needs. And so I'll just start with, I have a lot of families who um, are partnered, married people. And what I find with my moms is they believe that they're the only person that I have to do it, that I'm their person, that nobody else will do it right. They won't do it like me. And my answer to that is perfect. Fantastic. Your child needs to have experiences where people don't meet their needs in the way that you do so that they can adjust to it and you can adjust to. I actually really tried to separate my that, that identity that I held for so long. And I just did a podcast about this, about being your child's person. While that's sweet, while that's endearing, while that might be validating to you, it's not necessarily good for your child or for you to have a single person dependency. So one of the first things that I do is say, if people are offering help, you take it, right? If dad could do it, but he doesn't do it perfect, that's fine too. Grandma is willing, Let's go grandma, like taking on those opportunities. Another thing that I tell my um, families is tell people what you need because people are well-meaning for the most part. And they'll say, well, whatever you need, just let me know whatever you need. And that actually puts a burden on you in some way. Like, okay, now I need to figure it out. But that's also the case. They don't really know how they can help you. So if you want the help, it's like, hey, on Tuesdays at 9 a.m., I have a class I'd like to go to. Is that the day that you can do this? You no, know, it would be really great if you could drop food off. Like being very direct with people about how they can help you because they want to help, but they don't know how. Do you feel like sometimes people are just... Uh... And maybe I do this as well, is that I have a I have a hesitancy to go out and ask for help because I don't want anybody to feel like they're a burden or sure. that, that I'm causing any sort of Absolutely. disruption to their everyday life. Where's the where's the balance on that for, for a family to know that you know what it's okay to do that? How do you coach around that? Because it's it's a mental piece of like, you yeah, know, I'm gonna be sure. okay with it. I think you start with the people who you're closest to, who you have the least amount of that resistance for and letting them know, like I, like for instance, we'll go out to dinner sometimes, my friends and I, and I will say to them, I, I don't want to talk about autism at all. And I'll just like tell, cause they're, they're like, you know, what's going on with Ben? Like, have you gotten him placed? Like what's it? And I'm like, I, I want to know autism kind of a conversation. So that's me telling them what I need. Sometimes I will call up a friend. I'm just going to be, listen, I'm going to have a five minute tantrum. I just want to be angry. Can you hear this? Right? Like those are ways that I actually tell people. Um, and I'm quite, you know, look, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't start this on my first day. I started this, after, started this after some really, really challenging things that have happened where I've gotten to the point where it's like, you know what, this is a, supposed to be a one person show. The fact is, is I've had my child have very high levels of care at some of the best places in the country. And if they couldn't figure it out, I shouldn't be have to figure it out by myself either. Right. Like, so I actually gave myself the permission to be like, it's okay that you can't figure out the intersection between autism, OCD and a mood disorder because no one has. <laughs> right? Like, So there's just, you know, was I doing this my first or second year or third year? No. Do I urge people to start it early? Yes. Is, it, is that, I mean, part of the unique demands is the fact that, you know, first of all, you have some of these high expectations. You're expecting things to change overnight. And that if you just keep plugging away at something and put in 120, 130%, is that yeah. things will get better. Not knowing that if I'm taking that percentage away from somewhere else, is that I'm not in the right space to be doing any of this. Like I just, I, I put myself in a place where I can't achieve my goals. Do you feel like oftentimes that when you're working with families or maybe even in your own experience, the times where you were going above and beyond, 
and almost kind of burning the candle at both ends to try and be able to service every second of your child's life were the times where you were almost not your full self or not able to contribute in the way that you wanted. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you actually, you diminished your capacity to, you diminished your ability to have capacity for your kids, right? So you can be doing all of these things for them and then implementing with them you know, one-on-one the daily, you can be very trigger happy, right? Because you have all of this stress, all of these, like, you know, last year within a week, we moved to, well, we reload, you know, temporarily moved to Rhode Island to attend an intensive OCD program for 12 weeks. I had to figure out the lodging. I had to figure out that everything within, you know, a little bit. And so I was like, up to you know my eyeballs and stress and strategy and figuring this all out and then you know, I still have a person who I have to parent and he's asking me questions and he's doing his thing and I have no capacity for it whatsoever right and so it's like noticing how that can happen pretty easily when you are so hyper focused on helping them but because of that and all of that stress that you have and you're not um balancing it with anything for yourself, then you have actually less capacity for the actual child who you're trying to help. No, for sure. And I would, I would also imagine is that there's got to be a piece to it. So I put in more effort when I feel like what I'm doing is either not working or it's causing frustration or pain for others around me, which in a situation where if I had, if my daughter was acting out or was aggressive, I'd immediately look at the social impact of that, of everything that's happening. And I'd start getting kind of, okay, well, I got to figure out how to make this work at school. I got to figure out how to make this work on her sports. I got It puts so much of that out there. How much does the community play a role in supporting either the empowerment of the family, empowerment of the child, acceptance of the fact that, you know, this is, this is something that they're going through and you can't be frustrated with the family because well, of what's occurring. That's really in, a complicated. I, I don't know that I know the answer to that question. The way I could answer it, though, is the impact of the perception of other people so deeply impacts the parent. And so what I will say is it's never about the behavior. It's not about the fact that your kid is losing it in target. It's about the fact that you're thinking other people are judging you as a parent, that they're judging your kid, that if they're doing this when they're five, what are they going to be like when they're 10? And what if they do this in school and I get the phone call from school and then I have to come home from work. And so we're taking kid crying in Walmart or Target and we're like extrapolating it out, like, you know, in our minds instantly. And that leads to a lot of, you know, catastrophizing, a lot of fight flight. And so we don't really know what other people think about us. But what we'll, but we have these thoughts about what it should look like and what it shouldn't look like. And so there's that piece. There's us looking on Instagram or social, seeing other people's lives and then comparing our lives to it. And then this belief that we're not normal, that we're outside that, you know, and so all of that is very, very isolating. At, you know, now, could you be in Target and somebody come up to you and say, listen, I totally get this. You got this. Don't worry. I'm sure that would feel great. But the chances of that happening like on the regular, right? And just as human beings are, like it's yeah. not. You know, I see kids melting down all the time in Target and I'm like, oh, that poor mother. Now, she doesn't know that I'm thinking that. You know, mm-hmm. she thinks that I'm thinking that she's terrible. I'm totally not, right? But So it really, what it comes down to is your ability to grow your capacity for these discomforting situations and have your own back and really tune out that noise so you can focus on what you can control. No, and I I think that's a, a very valuable piece, not only for parents to understand, but for clinicians to understand is that as much as you could try and put together a service plan or an education plan or a treatment plan for the child, If you're not taking into account the emotional impact that historically has occurred for the family, because not you're you're hitting ups and downs. You have successes and you have failures, like everybody else. Like I go through that. Like life doesn't go linear. Um, Is that you have all that? If they if that's not taken into consideration, 
you're never going to be able to empower the family to be able to live their best life and to really enjoy everything that's going on around them. Is this is this a piece? I know that you work with families on being able to establish with mothers. So you work with mothers on establishing this, but how much do you actually help them to advocate in other environments to help coach those around them? Because you almost need the community to understand what it is that you're working on sometimes. Yeah, you know, it. so what I, I really focus on their ability to not seek the external validation of other people approving of their decisions. I work on their own self-confidence and having their own back in their decisions. And if you want to choose on a given day to educate a person, then you can, but it's not your responsibility. And I don't put that extra layer on top of them, right? Like sometimes I just want to get out of Target. I don't want to explain to the, you know, the lady who's giving me a dirty look, this is an autistic meltdown. It's not because he's a bad kid. It's because of this. Hey, I know he's 15 years old and he looks like he's dangerous, but that like, I can't take that on all of the time. So it's more of just having your own capacity to support yourself in those moments. Um, I do work with parents with how to talk to their family members about what's going on, but always with the understanding is that other people will think what they want. You can give them all the education in the world. And some people will look at our kids and be like, hey, just a brat. If you just disciplined him, if you didn't let him get away with so much, right? They're allowed to have those thoughts. And I'm really focusing on my mom and how she's not internalizing that and judging herself, judging her child and just feeling terrible. Yeah. And and I guess um, I might have articulated my question wrong, but I think what your message is going to the to the mother is equally beneficial, that message being absorbed by the clinical and by the stakeholder community of saying, okay, so everything that that you've just kind of put out there to say, you know, this is how I work with the parent, the more that I understand that as a clinician, that this is what's needed on the parent level, it actually makes better decision making for me on, you know, how to incorporate them, how to understand where that 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 person might be in their journey to know that I'm not overwhelming somebody yeah. through the process and putting the burden on them to tell me to stop. Like yeah. it, it's that it's that understanding. But then that's where I think that that overlap exists, where education is power. Not that the mom would have to do it, but I love your message coming to the the clinical world to say, understand it, empathize with it, sympathize with it. Um, so what I, I will say though, what I and I just say what I have found with a lot of my moms, like um it's interesting that as our coaching has evolved, a lot of them will do their own writing and their own blogs. And I've seen them evolve in their willingness to educate people, but not from the place of like, you don't understand me, this isn't fair, is to let me tell you what this is like. Let mm-hmm. me a peek into what this is like and it's a much more I think inviting way for other people to learn as well because it's not it just has a different tone to it right I I know because people will come to me and they'll get very upset like someone said my kid doesn't look autistic and how dare they I'm like well they don't Mm -hmm. right like we we all know what that means it's interestingly people do not say that to me about my son anymore he looks very autistic but that doesn't come from a bad place we have these limited perceptions of what these things are in life and if we want to pick our points where we want to um you know educate other people we want to bring them into the world help them understand we can but i'm never really from the point of view of doing it from a hostile place where I understand why parents get upset when people say like, he seems normal to me. It's like, yeah, because they have a very limited view of what autism looks like. And that's kind of not their fault. I have a very limited view of what type one diabetes looks like. I have a bigger view now that one of my friend's sons has it. Right. Mm -hmm. But unless you're living it, you wouldn't know. And so I, so I guess like the long version is like, you have to come to your own level of acceptance and understanding and comfort before you're going to be able to bring other people in. 
Uh, before people get to that level of comfort, is that um, obviously you you had some of the resources to get to the the life coach that that was so instrumental and in, and in even where you're going right now as far as your career path. But when parents haven't gotten to that point and they're trying to understand these feelings that they're experiencing and they they have not reached out for external supports, what are some of the signs that are typically there that like, you know, I'm struggling, I'm burning out and I might not even know I'm burning out. And what are those signs that that people should look out for? So um, I, so I, I talk about, um, when I talk about the burnout cycle, I talk about high value activities and low value activities. And so they are, in my view, engaging in a lot of low value activities and not many high value activities. Low value activities are the activities that are going to increase your stress, your fight flight. They are going to keep you stuck. The high value activities are things that allow you to release your stress cycle. So for instance, um, if you find yourself always catastrophizing, always going to the worst case scenario, always fearing about your child's future, always thinking things like nobody gets us, I'm alone. Those to me are signs that you're in a burnout cycle. If you are at the same time um, avoiding connection with others because they don't get you, if you are not doing things for yourself because I don't have time for that, I got an autistic child, we got other things to do. Those things together are, that's what puts you in that cycle of burnout. And so I like to show that to my clients and we're not talking about like, you're never going to be burnt out again. And here, you know, but like, how can we interrupt the cycle a little bit? How can we balance the scale? I can teach you how to stop catastrophizing, right? I can teach you how to redirect your brain. I can teach you how to regulate your nervous system so that you're not constantly in a state of fight or flight. I can teach you how to prioritize your self-care, even if that's just five minutes right? There's so many things that we can do for self-care that we could do sitting down in our chair. Mind management is one of them, right? But you're not letting your mind run to like, you know, the worst possible case scenario, jacking up your cortisol levels. If you stop just that, you'd be in a better place. Now, it's interesting is that with a lot of things is that people can kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, I need to start taking better care of myself. And, and the commonalities between like, you know, a bad work situation where you're sitting there and you're struggling through every day and you keep putting more on your plate and everything's about work. Every thought is about work and you're not seeing value because you're not getting the the promotion that you want. And then you engage in self-sabotaging behavior. We might seek life coaching for that Mm -hmm. because we feel like, hey, I can go fix that. Oftentimes is that when it becomes raising my family, or it becomes something about working with my children, is that we have a little bit more hesitancy to demonstrate that same vulnerability to say, you know, I, I, need, I need help on how to recenter myself here. I need help on getting there. If you were to talk with a, I mean, and, and you oftentimes do obviously talk with families about this, but when somebody's exploring this for themselves, what's the immediate advantage of saying, you know what, just even having that catharsis of talking about this has value or coming in and creating a plan has value. How do you approach getting somebody to kind of stop center and and get to a point where they can start working on themselves? I think it's um, being seen without judgment. And I think that's what I offer my clients is that they don't have to explain autism to me at all. And I've explained autism to quite a few therapists, right? I've explained the, you know, how a 15 year old needs a babysitter, or like what a meltdown looks like. And with me, especially, you know, people who come with me, maybe they've been through my podcast, maybe they've seen me on Instagram, they have this like, oh, she gets it. And sometimes that alone is so disarming. And when you feel that you're able to get to work and I can tell my clients they need to go take care of themselves and they don't get angry with me. They don't tell me you don't get it. They know that I do. And so then it's like, okay, well, how can we do this? And so I think it's like um, everyone wants to be seen. Everyone wants to feel like they're understood. And I think that um, when people come to me, they, they are already feeling that. And so then the conversation is, how can we spend just some of your time focused on you so that you can show up as the parent you want to be, even when it looks nothing like you imagined? Yeah. And and from what I've heard a lot of families talk about is being my best parent 60% of the time is far better 
than trying to parent 130% of the time. And Absolutely. it's one of those like, hey, if I could be 60% awesome, like yeah. why not? <laughs> Three out of 10, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what happens? I mean, give me a worst case scenario. Somebody's not taking care of themselves and they're not recognizing this burnout. At what at, uh, what parts of their lives are going to be affected by this? And I mean, what is yeah. what are the things that could occur? What's the triggering and the, the cascading effect of this? Yeah, so I've seen it. Um, I, one, it it impacts their relationship with themselves to the extent that they have one at all, where they're very much down on themselves. They're blaming themselves. They're resenting themselves. They're kind of fed up with themselves. It greatly impacts their relationship with their child right? They don't enjoy spending time with their child. They just view their child as, you know, what they're, what are they going to do next? There's a lot of guilt, right? So it impacts that. Impacts relationships with partners because partners often get into like, you know, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Then maybe somebody doesn't understand. They're looking for their partner to validate their emotions. They're looking for them to breathe their mind, to step in. You know, a lot of that happens. It impacts your relationship with other family members and with friends because you don't feel that they understand. And so you become more, um, you're isolating. Um, at work, it's the same thing. You're less engaged and you have a less ability to um, distance yourself even when you can, because, you know, when folks are sitting around the water cooler talking about their last vacation and the tournaments and the soccer championship, and you're like, that's not my life. <laughs> right? And so this all just leads to um, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, depression, despair, loneliness. And when you were in those states, you have zero to no capacity to really manage whatever's happening with your kid. So you're trigger happy, you're yelling, you're screaming, then you're feeling guilty. And it's like a rinse and repeat cycle. And so when you're talking about all these signs and you're talking about, you know, that somebody, if they're not taking the step to find either the support network, the life coach, Finding a, a, a community that that is just around them that they can they can experience this with and just kind of be there and help to kind of take some of the burden off of them so that they can enjoy and, and choose some of those high level activities. Yeah. Um, I I have this and maybe it's selfish of me. It's it's I'd love to see this navigate its way into the autism treatment community somehow and figure out how in the world you connect these things. What's the collaborative effort with life coaches to make sure that there's a holistic approach with families and their treatment plan? What, what yeah. would be your ideal situation? Uh, Where's your utopia? <laughs> well, I will um, I will give you a link to an article that I wrote um, for Autism Awareness Month, and it's um, the missing piece of the autism treatment puzzle is the treatment of parents, because we are the common thread through all of it. We are the 24-7 implementers of it, and we are completely ignored, and it's a hugely missing piece. And so I'm going to be honest with you. There are so many missing pieces of the treatment of autism itself. It's hard for me to sit, see the point where, you know, the medical community is going to be like, oh, and well, we need to bring in this whole other resource. That's why, you know, I have a podcast. I'm on other people's podcasts. I like to beat the drum as much as possible. This is the missing piece of the puzzle. If you want to help your kid, you have to help yourself. You are their greatest resources. I've been through this for 15 years. I've been at it at multiple states multiple therapists, psychiatrists, medications, programs. I am the common thread through it all. If I burn out, you know, no. he's less served. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but you, know, you probably at that point, if you've taken it all on your own shoulders and nobody else has been there to be able to kind of pick up the slack of when you need to be able to say, hey, you know, this is something that somebody else can be taken care of. Yeah is that you haven't created that safety net for, for your child to be able to continue to thrive in your absence if they need the safety net. Oh. So, I mean, a lot of children don't. But one thing that's hit me recently is that, um, so compassionate care is working its way finally through a lot of the treatment programs. So is community-informed programming. But when you look at the goals that 
and, and I'll say funders are looking at, but even clinicians are prescribing for families, they're very child specific. They're saying your child will do this with you, blah, blah, blah. And, and as much as that might be a wonderful end game, ultimately the goal should be about empowering a parent, I would imagine. And that's probably the best way to get to best levels of care is the parent says, this is what I need. Well, let's figure out goals to be able to get there and achieve that so that you can be the best parent possible versus trying to say that everything you are doing has to be focused around an achievable objective of your child right now. Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, what, the reason I got into this specifically is I always knew I wanted to do something to serve the autism community, but from my own experience, experiences, experiences knowing how different kids with autism are, I really believe that the best way I could serve that community was by serving the parents because the parents are the people who are taking on for each child, right? They are figuring it out. So if I can help them, the ripple effect is it does help the child. It does help the family. No, absolutely. And I appreciate the fact that you're that you're out there and that you're talking about these issues because without it, it's, it stops people from thinking. And if we aren't talking about it on a regular basis, we're not going to make ourselves better because we're not challenging ourselves to, to really think outside of what we already think we know. Yeah. And it's it's having these discussions that bring about more. But what advice would you would you give to parents right now? Um, there are a lot of people that um, have wonderful experiences with uh, neurodivergent um, lives and neuro neurodivergent children where, you know, it's it's little nuances that are like, you know, this little thing happened and it's uh, maybe, it made me feel like the people were looking at me weird or people didn't accept what I was doing or accept that my child was doing this and they still internalize it. And then you have the other end where maybe there is some more profound areas of um, disruption to one's life that, that are, are, are being contributed by autism and it could be aggression and self-injury where it's just so overwhelming and emotional where it's just you can't give yourself to that 110 percent of the time because there's no way that you can carry that emotion with you constantly trying to be able to work through it what would you be saying to these parents because they all i think benefit from life skills coaching at different levels what would you be telling them as they're trying to say, how do I fit this into my day? Life, like life coaching into your day? Mm -hmm. or Life coaching. Oh yeah, life coaching is super easy to fit into your day because it's, it's, it's all about how you operate as a human. It's understanding the machine, our biology. And so for instance, if you're the parent whose kid's being like a little quirky in Target, maybe they're stimming and you feel that, <gasps> right? That's your, that, that, that's biology working. That's your fight flight response. As human beings, the scariest thing is for us to be on the outside, to feel judged. That means we might get voted off of the island and we might die. That is where our biology actually takes us. When you can notice that and then be like, oh, we're in Target and these are strangers. You can be like, Whoosh. Right. You can actually self soothe your own nervous system. Right. You, when you are able to see where your brain is going and what's happening in your body and you have the tools to down regulate yourself, you can take that anywhere. You get the email from the boss with an explanation point and your body goes like this. It's like our bodies are programmed. Right. Like to, to respond like that to the lion that's chasing us or to the email. And so it's like when you are able to bring those skills into your situation then you have you have more capacity to respond versus react. You know what how to separate a big deal from a little deal, right? When it's things like aggression, when it's things that are dangerous, like knowing how your body's going to respond and being able to take care of yourself in those moments, like for me, has been the difference between escalating a dangerous situation to make it even more dangerous. So for instance, I had a situation with my son the other day where he was aggressing me and we were in the car and there was traffic. And so for me to be able to get my wits about me to be like, hey, we just need to be safe. Just get in the car. So that's using life's coaching, which is voice, 
what you're saying, how you're saying it, the tone of your voice communicates safety to his nervous system that gets him back in the car, that gets him to start calming down, right? Those things, it's like you can use them every day, anytime for everything. And they just make you better, more capable at responding to whatever's happening in your life. Uh, that's one of my favorite things about what I've learned a lot through the podcasts in general is that most of these skills aren't unique to autism or neurodiversity. It's, oh, these are yeah. skills that we all benefit from always. Um, and I'm glad you said that. Well, it's funny you say that because the way I found life coaching was through a podcast by a life coach who used to be a lawyer who was talking about lawyer stress. And I'm listening to her and I would start incorporating it. And I was like, oh, this works. Oh, it could work here too. Mm -hmm. And that and that's how, that was my avenue in. Yeah. All of yeah. It. So yeah, absolutely. absolutely. If you have a brain and a nervous system, it will help you. <laughs> it's guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is nice at times to be able to see yourself in whatever it is that's occurring. Yeah. So knowing right now that this has been successful with families who are experiencing the journey of autism, but that gives me more like, oh, okay, well, I'll make that first step. I'll go ahead and do it. When somebody's making that first step, what, what are the resources that, that you would say, hey, go check this out. Go look at these resources. I know you've put it, quite a few out there as far as your podcast, but where would you tell parents to go look right now? Look for resources about life coaching. About life coaching and, and even just understanding their journey right now to know that it's it's something that others are experiencing. Yeah. So for, for life coaching, I got to tell you, because life coaching is an unregulated industry and anybody can call themselves a life coach. And I do and I am certified. But, you know, you you could find all kinds of things about life coaching. I'm not really sure if there, if there, if I could say go here and this will help you because all life coaches do something different. I, what I do is based on cognitive behavioral theory and is based on nervous system informed tools, polyvagal informed somatics, right? That I um, am a student of. Um, as for having people understand your experience, that's something where support groups, even Facebook groups can be helpful. I will say, I will say loudly, not all Facebook groups are created equal. And so I am very, very um, careful about the time that I spend in these groups because they can become the misery Olympics in some ways. They can bring you down. And sometimes, and one of the biggest tools that I like to teach to my parents is constraint. You don't need to know what everyone is doing because what our brains do, whether we're comparing ourselves to the supermodel and what she's eating, or we're comparing ourselves to the severely disabled child, we're always comparing and contrasting and we're internalizing that. And yes, it's nice to have community. Yes, it's nice to know that other people are going through what you're going through. And you need to temper that with your own mental health and your own ability to absorb that information. Oh, that's wonderful advice, Lisa. And, and I appreciate you coming on and sharing not only your knowledge with us, but also your experience. Because I think that any time where we have these conversations, it creates dialogue, it creates buzz, but it also gets everybody at least talking about these subjects mm -hmm. to realize how is it that I can support it? Where can I contribute? Where can I start incorporating this into my life, into my practice, into whatever it may be that's important to them? So I appreciate you coming on to our podcast to talk about this today. Well, I actually, I have two resources, one for parents of kids with autism. And then if you're also interested, one letter that I wrote that was really to um, people around people, you know, like, how can you help? And it was like six steps of things that you can actually do to support a family, to support a person. And so one is an article that I, I, I can link, I think it's on my blog. And the other is a, um, a freebie that I have that's called the seven, the seven truths every autism parent needs to know. And this comes from my 40 plus experience, you know, as a sister, as a sibling, as a parent, as a coach about the things I think are most important in guiding you through this journey. It's not tactical in the sense of like, you know, call up your pediatrician and get a wellness, you know, it, but it's like, it's the things that run. I, I coach, I coach mothers with kids from two to 22 and all of these truths apply regardless. 
Yeah, it sounds like probably the things we oftentimes forget about, but probably are the most important. So <laughs> I'm glad that you had that. And we'll definitely share that resource because it's going to be valuable for every single person that's either a part of a, a family's life or who are experiencing themselves this journey. So we'll definitely be able to share that information. And, and once again, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to meet you. I so appreciate you having me on your podcast. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week. Thank you.